Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for worship. We're going to worship right in this moment with a, a testimony, okay? A testimony is another form of worship as we lift up God's name. We, we praise him for what he has done. And this past week, we got to witness him at work through VBS here at our church. VBS is churchy language for Vacation Bible School, which basically means a whole lot of fun and a whole lot of craziness and a whole lot of color and way too many kids making a ruckus and we give God all the glory. <laughs> So I'm hanging on, I'm clinging to this coffee cup this morning because I'm exhausted from all the fun we had this past week as uh, we had over double the number of kids and families that we had last year for our VBS. And so praise God for that. But more important even than that was that as we were playing with these kids, as we were worshiping alongside these kids, as we were having conversations with them at, at, at tables where we directed parents, well, who we called squad leaders, to, to have an intentional conversation with kids, three of these young people accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior this past week. Yeah, give him, that's a miracle. That's not just one miracle, that's three miracles. As, as God transforms a life, as he breathes new life, into something that was lost and hurting that was far, far away from God. That the scripture says that we've all gone astray and that we were all far from a perfect and holy God. But he works miracles. He pursues us. He chases us down. We sing these kinds of songs, right? Worshiping who he is. And we got to see it in person this week in the lives of these kids. And so, yes, I am exhausted. Honestly, I don't even know how I'm going to make it through the message this morning. So, you know, if I ramble or mumble, please forgive me. But I'm riding the high of, of seeing what God's doing in the lives of our church, our church family, what he's doing in this community. And so as we continue to sing this morning, keep that in mind. Recall back to where you're seeing God moving in your own life or in the lives of those who you do life with and let's praise him for what he continues to do. All right? Let's continue to sing together. I don't want anything but you. You're more than every dream come true. All of the things I thought I Now that I'm yours and you are mine, I love is the secret that I find. I'll spend forever in the pleasure I found looking in your eyes. So give me Jesus.
blessed assurance Jesus is mine He's been my fourth man in the fire time after time Born of His Spirit and washed in His blood
Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his in his blood. So this is, so this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my Praising my Savior all the day long. Praising my Savior all the day long. I'm praising my Savior all the day long. Father God, uh, this morning we just pray that you, uh, your name is just lifted up in this place. God, we praise you for what you did this week. Uh, we praise you, God, for what we know you're going to do this morning. And God, we praise you for just everything we know you're going to continue to do. God, may our lives just be a testimony of how awesome you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. If you're a kid, you can head on out with Roberto right now to class. Well, good morning again. Thank you. Uh, Today, we are going to be talking about Faith. I I hope that sometimes when I when I pose these words, start with like a theme or a word for that for that morning, it catches you off guard, but like in a good way, where you go, oh wait, this is how my mind works. Oh wait, is this a test? What's my definition? What 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 have I what what, what I got stored on there? Where's, let me flip through the rolodex of my brain and find something on faith. <laughs> where do we where do we go for that? But the truth is, is that I'm going to talk to you for the next few minutes about it, so you don't have to know anything about faith, because we're going to have a conversation about it. We have been going through this book called Core 52, using it as a framework for this past year, starting in January, looking at what are some of the core passages of Scripture and and corresponding ideas that inform our faith and our walk with God, that relationship that we're seeking with with a, a Father in heaven And today, it brings us to this topic of faith. So this is, uh, I believe it's chapter 28 in the Core 52 book. If you don't have one of those yet with us, we have some out in the lobby, and you can take one of those with you. If you'd like to help offset the cost, you can uh, drop $10 in in one of the giving boxes uh, to help offset that cost um, to the church. And um, this is a big topic. We We talked about, like, the gospel well, a core piece of the gospel is this idea of faith. And so I want to open with a word of prayer, just a short prayer as, as we get into this. Um, and, uh, and, and then we'll look at scripture together. Heavenly Father, uh, I'm not 100% here today. And, uh, and so, Lord, I pray that you just take me out of the way and that we hear from you as we open your word, that we come... To, to a greater understanding of who you are, a greater love for your, your person and your plan, that we understand ourselves and who you created us to be, and that we could join you in your work because of today's conversation. We love you, Lord, and we pray all these things in your beautiful name. Amen. 
All right. This idea of faith, for a lot of us, is, is purely an intellectual exercise. We, we sometimes, those of us who have been walking with God for a while, fall into a habit of thinking about faith, reading scriptures on the word faith, which by the way, the word faith in like my NIV shows up over 450 times, okay? So the Bible has a lot to talk about, a lot to say about faith, and we're only going to kind of scratch the surface a little bit this morning. But it becomes this intellectual exercise of like, okay, if I had to define it as I start studying for this week, like, okay, faith might be like a, an intellectual assent to the personhood of Jesus, who he is, what he represents. It might be like a, a coming to agreement with the wisdom of scripture. We might think of faith as some sort of like um, uh, um, understanding of God or even a, a uh, almost like an intellectual contract of, okay, I am going to choose you, God, and put my faith in you in return for eternal life. But when we look at what Scripture has to say, those kind of intellectual only, right, that narrow little view of what faith is doesn't fit with the rest of what we see in Scripture. In the, in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, there's, it, it's kind of called like the heroes of faith chapter. It has that nickname in some church circles because it goes through like a chronological order of these stories of Scripture talking about different people who by faith did dot, 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 dot. And if you look at that story, I mean, in that chapter, like that word faith starts to look a whole lot more like a verb than some sort of intellectual exercise. It looks like it takes like action, movement, but that kind of makes us Christians uncomfortable, uncomfortable a little bit because we know that we don't come to faith by some sort of action of our own. We don't get to like, like somehow initiate some faith. Scripture tells us that actually faith comes from hearing, that we've heard about God, that he has influenced our lives, that he has made himself known to us or revealed himself to us, and that's where faith can begin from. It's more of a response. Or that sometimes we get uncomfortable with faith being some sort of an action because we start to wrestle with, well, it says that, that God's grace and his gift and this gift of eternal life is freely given to us and that it's not something we can earn and so if we start wrestling with this idea of faith and we somehow think it's an action, then it starts to sound like we're somehow maybe earning some sort of salvation or earning some sort of relationship with God. And that, that, that's counter to Scripture as well. Some people try to define faith like it's some sort of like affection, right? A lot of our songs that we sing have this affectionate kind of tone or nature to these songs as we're singing about who God is. And so some people would define faith as like a, a feeling, an affection, a love, an admiration for who God is and what he has done. But faith is bigger than that. I would say that, yes, it actually encompasses all of those three things, but it's, it goes even beyond. It goes beyond that I mean, we're talking about a, a spiritual reality, and so we can't just confine it to some physical action we take or some intellectual pursuit we make or some, like, emotion or feeling that probably is a series of, you know, uh, uh, um, chemical releases within our body. We, we have to remember that we are spiritual beings in addition to physical that there's like this marriage in who God created us to be. As we bear his image, as scripture says, God is spirit and so, and so are we. And so we're going to dig into faith uh, across the Old Testament and the New Testament with a bunch of scriptures today. And I'm going to have to lean on that scripture as we try to wrestle with this. And this will be kind of a wrestle today. Uh, I'm going to have to lean on that scripture in order to let God speak through his word. And so as, as, we're, as we're 
looking at these scriptures, allow yourself to be challenged. Allow the Holy Spirit maybe to whisper something into your consciousness that you hadn't thought of before. Um, that, that in itself is an act of faith to, to say, I'm going to listen. I'm going to listen. Okay? So today, we're going we're gonna to actually talk about Noah. Abraham is usually the one that like, gets kind of all the press when we talk, start talking about faith. Okay? But we're going to look at Noah today. Love the story of Noah uh, I would, I I'm hesitant to put my, my label like as favorite or something like that on it because it is, it is a disaster. It, it's an epic story of, of evil being conquered and, and punished. It's an epic story of, of the world being destroyed and remade. I mean, this is, this is like, you know, beyond Hollywood movies kind of epic stuff in this story. And... And we're going to look at it because we get to see more of Noah's actions than anything else, and we can glean a lot from it, okay? So we're actually going to start in the book of Mark, but we're going to get to Noah's story in a second. If you want to turn with me to Mark chapter 1, it's actually where we started, uh, I believe, last week as well. We're going to look at Mark chapter 1, verse 15 first. It says... The time has come. This is, this is Jesus speaking. He's beginning his ministry. He says, the time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, you might not scribble the word faith next to that verse in your Bible, but that's what Jesus is talking about here. He is talking about a vision for a future that we can put our hope in. The kingdom of God has come near, right? He's, he's referring to himself, right? The author and perfecter of our faith. And he's telling us what we can respond, how we can respond to him with these words, repent and believe. Now, a lot of us, at least me, maybe, maybe I don't know, I, I guess I'm assuming too much. I don't know where you land, but I would normally maybe use that word faith as a, as a synonym for believe. I might kind of swap those in. But as I'm studying scripture this week, I find that there's like this dual nature to this idea of faith that includes not, like I said, not just that uh, affection for God and um, acknowledgement of what he has done and, uh, and like, you know, a sign on the dotted line hope that, uh, that he's going to do what he said he's going to do with this whole believe part. But then it also says repent. And a lot of us, when we hear that word repent, think stop doing bad things. Right? We almost shudder when we hear that word because we're like, ooh, ouch. But the way it's often used in scripture is that you actually turn to something new. We are focusing on the old, but the connotation of the word repent is that there's something better to pursue, something better to go after, someone better to follow, someone better to, to pledge your allegiance to. If you think about like the military, when you go to like basic training in the military, these guys spend a lot of time just like standing in line, standing at attention, saluting, like they march. And you look at that stuff and you're like, what in the world is the point? Well, they're training discipline, right? But they're training a discipline with or coupled to an allegiance to the right thing. Right? When you get out on the battlefield, they have to know that these soldiers, when they are told to carry out an order or when they come under fire or when a bomb goes off or when they're called on to, to render medical aid, that they will respond with the correct allegiance, that they will choose the right thing in that moment, that they will react in the right way. And here we start to see an, a, a, a picture of what 
the Bible refers to as faith. Because faith is beyond just that, that cutesy, warm and cuddly, uh, 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 fuzzy feelings of affection or just an intellectual exercise of saying, yes, I agree with those principles or something like that. It is an allegiance to a new Lord. Faith is an allegiance to a new king. Jesus. And so those soldiers had to have an allegiance where they, they looked beyond themselves, right? The coward looks only after his own well-being. And so he panics when that is threatened and he loses his mind. But we see bravery on the battlefield because they can think, uh, a soldier can think beyond himself or herself. They can look to somebody or something that they love, and not just a warm and fuzzy love, but a self-sacrificial, motivating, uh, you know, verb kind of love that causes them to move. And, you know, a, a, a soldier drags his buddy off the battlefield. A, a mo- mothers have lifted cars off their children. It, it causes them to move because of their love for somebody else. And when the scripture talks about faith, it's a, it's, it's a love, it's a trust, it's an allegiance that causes us to act differently, to react differently. So this scripture says, repent and believe the good news He's saying, throw away all your old allegiances because there's this good news that you can believe in, you can can assent to, you can understand, you can love, and you can turn to it and you can pursue it with everything you are. It's going to affect every piece of your life. Every piece. Now let's talk about Noah. Noah. Genesis chapter 6, we find this guy named Noah. And the world is pretty new. We're not that many generations into this whole creation saga that God has kicked off and started. And we find, God finds, God's observing, that people have turned to evil everywhere. Like things have gotten really, really, really bad. Instead of like, you know, using shovels to dig and to farm, people are killing each other with them instead, right? Like things have gotten really bad. And God decides he's going to bring judgment upon the world. This is an epic story. God being good has to judge evil. But he remembers this guy named Noah. Noah. And this is where we're going to pick up here. So I'm in, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know if I told you where we're going. I'm in Genesis chapter 6. And I'm going to read in verse, starting in verse 11. It says, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, For the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. He says, so make yourself an ark of cypress wood. I want to pause there before we go on and just fill in in some some, uh, um, ideas for us so that we're all on the same page as I look at this. God approached a guy who was not sinless. He was a guy that is called righteous in Scripture, and so he had a good relationship with God and maybe a good relationship with some other people, but he wasn't sinless. And God tells him, he gives him information, I am going to destroy this world and all life on it. He gives him this information, and he doesn't force Noah to do anything He just, at this point, is simply giving Noah information that he can absorb, 
that he can wrestle with to understand, that he can choose to do something with or about. But it's going to cost Noah something, right? This isn't like comfortable, like I just went to the movies, it's Harkins, they've got the popcorn, the soda, and I saw a story. This is real life, Noah. Like this, God is telling him this is going to happen and he has to choose how he is going to respond to that information. He can do nothing. He can just go, hmm, let me write a book about it or let me uh, uh, talk about it around the dinner table or, hey, we can, we can get together and share stories sometime and I'll tell the story of that time God told me about this flood that's coming or something like that. He has to choose how he's going to respond and God in just a second, is going to give him a command, which is still a choice for Noah to respond to, but he gets to choose, do I want to do that? Do I want to put my, my, my faith in God, my trust in what he has said and what he's, who he is and what he's going to do, and so respond in obedience to what he said, or do I just want to think about it for a while? Let, let's read on. God says, so make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. It goes on to say that he's going to build rooms inside this thing. God tells him to make, to collect food for both himself and animals. God says he's going to send these animals, two of every kind, to the ark for him to, to take care of and to put on the ark to protect. He says that certain kinds of animals, like the edible, like sort of domesticated ones, he's going to send them seven of, of these certain kind of kinds of animals. Like we're probably going to eat those. You need them to reproduce a little bit quicker and repopulate a little bit faster. So I'm going to send you more of those. But God says, this is what I'm going to do. And this is what I want you to do. And Noah has to make a decision. He has to make a decision about what he's going to do. Let me show you a picture. This is in Kentucky. This is a real thing. This isn't like a CGI or something like that. This is in Kentucky. This is called the Ark Encounter. They have a zoo at this place. And uh, some Christians have done a lot of research on like what is the length of a cubit of for your point of reference, there was actually two ancient cubits. There was like an 18-inch one, and there was a 21-and-a-half-inch one. They were actually based on like the average length of a man from his elbow to his fingertip at that time. Uh, they, they built this one off of, I think, the, the smaller number as like a conservative estimate, but likely it was actually built off of the 21-and-a-half-inch cubit because Moses wrote down this account. And when he wrote it down, he was writing to people who had grown up and lived in Egypt. And the Egyptians used what was called the royal cubit, the 21 and a half inch cubit. So when they heard it, you know, he didn't say, hey, we're using the small cubit. He just said, we're using the cubit. And they would have thought the Egyptian cubit. So it could have been even significantly bigger than this one, than this arc here. If you look down towards the bottom there, there's, there's this ramp. And below the ramp, you can see two people standing there for a sense of scale. This boat is enormous. I'm going to call it a boat, but it's really a ship. There are, prior to them building this, this arc here, uh, there was a lot of skeptics who thought it wasn't possible to build a wooden boat of this size because the, because the sheer size of it, they thought that like wooden timbers and things wouldn't be able to actually support it. They thought it would, you know, break into pieces. Like that's like legitimate debate out there. Uh, this boat is um, significantly bigger than anything that we have seen like, you know, in the colonial period when, when, you know, like when the early settlers were coming to America and were sailing over and, you know, these, ship, these wooden sailing ships and stuff like that. This thing is significantly bigger than anything from that time period. This is an epic story. God tells Noah, build a boat. He gives them some dimensions that probably they hadn't seen in his day either. 
he gives him this quest to go. I don't know how wealthy Noah is, but that had to have cost some time and money to put together, right? Like he, he calls him to do something crazy. Crazy. He calls him to do something wild and outrageous. And Noah has to choose how to respond. He has to choose how he's going to respond. God says, build a boat. Because this flood that's going to cover the entire surface of the world is coming. And if we're honest with ourselves, most of us would be like, yeah, I don't see that happening. That's a cute, that's a cute story, right? That's the way we, we tell these, this story to kids all the time. And you can find all kinds of pictures online of these little like bathtub arcs that are so cutesy with like, you know, some animals sticking with their heads out and it's almost comical. You know, it's cartoon-esque. That's, that's no cartoon. <laughs> that's serious business. God tells Noah to build a boat. And Noah has to choose how he's going to respond. If we go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, this is that, that kind of hall of heroes chapter. We see that it says in verse 1, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for. We're confident in what we hope for. And it's assurance about what we do not see. How could Noah be sure that that was going to happen? How could he be sure that water was going to cover the whole surface of the world, that somehow he'd be able to keep all these animals on this boat, keep them alive, and that they could survive this massive cataclysmic event and storm that somehow they could land and rebuild society afterwards, that somehow they'd be able to, in this, this new alien world that didn't look like it did before the flood, for sure, somehow, like, grow crops again, build homes, grow families, that an the animals wouldn't just die off one generation past the ark. How could he be sure? That's faith. He had been walking with God for a long time, I think, before God gave him this command, right? God knew Noah. He knew Noah was righteous, meaning like they had a relationship with one another. Noah had been taking little baby steps of faith long before he asked him to build an ark. And so God decides to rescue him. You see, it is not Noah's actions that save Noah. It was God's grace extended to Noah to say, this is what's going to happen and this is how you can be saved. And Noah it, responding in faith, right? Hope of a better future. If we're looking back at that verse 1, he had, he had hope, a confidence in this hope for a better future because God said it was going to be good an assurance that what God said was going to happen really was going to happen, even though he didn't see it yet. He chose to build a boat. He chose to step out in faith and do something. God had already provided the way for salvation. This ark, it's kind of like Jesus for us. God had provided a way for salvation, but Noah had to respond. God wasn't going to force it upon Noah. He wasn't going to pluck him and put him in on some boat against his will. Noah had to respond. And the building of the boat, even though it seems like this massive thing, it took a long time. It took a long time, and that wasn't for Noah's benefit, and it wasn't that Noah spent all that time and all that work that he was saved, because God could have miraculously saved him in a lot of ways. If God can create a cataclysmic event, he can save Noah, right? But that was God's extension of grace to a whole lot of other people around. If we go down to verse 7, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, it says, By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, and holy fear, like a, a respect, 
right? Like kids say, hey, mo- if I do that, mom and dad are going to kill me, right? That's like a respect thing between kids, kids and, and their parents. parents. In, a, in a holy respect for God, he built an ark, what? To save his family. His family, just like Noah didn't deserve to be saved, he am sure he was a sinner too. His family didn't deserve to be saved. But look at when a righteous man stands up in faith and steps out in faith to trust the Lord and do the right thing, look at how it starts to affect the world around him. His family are saved. If you go on in the story, it actually shows that, like, one of his kids was, like, a bad dude. And I'm not going to talk about that here today. But God was extending grace to the world around Noah, saying, you too can be saved if people would respond in faith. Because think about this. Theoretically, conceivably, somebody else could have seen Noah build in this boat, all right? It took him like a long time. I can't remember the exact dates. Go read your your Bible, look it up. It's like 65 to 100 years. I mean, it's a long time for this project. And maybe that included like years of just building up like a business and the wealth and maybe, you know, training some woodworking or, or maybe he was some woodworkers or maybe he was prototyping boats or something like that while he was figuring out how he was going to do this. But it took him a long time. And in the process of that, you know that he was coming into contact with other people who were going like, what are you doing? Tell me about this project. Right? In today's world, there would have been like news reporters coming out to be like, look at this guy building this boat. <laughs> the act of Noah trusting God and walking in this faith was a testament, a message of grace to the world around him where other people could have responded. Other people could have repented and turned back to God and maybe been invited upon this ark. Or other people could have gone and built their own boat, having conversations with Noah. But they didn't. Because they didn't trust God and repent or turn to God's plan and say, I'm I'm going with God on this one. Only Noah did. I'm going back to verse 7. It said, By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith he condemned the world. So now he's like a prophet, right? Because his faith was building something, saying, I'm going with God. And when other people rejected that, they, they were condemned. His faith, it says, condemned the world and he became heir of the righteousness that is keeping with faith. One of, the, one of the, the verses that a lot of people struggle with, lots of conversations with this one, lots of wrestling, comes from the book of James. And in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 17, it basically says, faith without works is dead. And we're back on that, on that wrestle with Wait, am I earning my salvation? No, you're not earning your salvation. You're responding. You're responding to God's grace in faith, in trusting what he says about who he is, about his plan, about what he's doing in the world and how we can walk with him. It's about our allegiance of our heart. And most of us, if we're honest, our allegiances lie with ourselves. We are a very individualistic person people group here in America. We love the cowboy, the lone ranger, right? And we, we are out for our own good. And, and I know we are. Like if I could confess to you guys a little thing, and I know this sounds silly, but go with me. I picked something little and silly to confess intentionally in this moment. There's been times where I, you know, just threw something in the recycling bin that maybe wasn't recyclable. (laughs) Because, yeah, yeah. (laughs) because it was convenient. Because maybe I didn't want to put my shoes on to walk across the rocks to get all the way to the other side of the can where the trash can was. Or because I didn't want to see it laying in my yard because the trash can was already full, so I just chucked it in there.
But God says there's a, a right way to live. There's a way to be a blessing in this world. There's a way that is right and good if we'll stop looking out only for ourselves. If we, can, if we can see beyond ourselves and think about not what's convenient in this moment, what's comfortable right now, what it is we really want, and we can look to him and say, God, what do you say is good? If we can place our allegiance with him, that's the path that leads to life. We were talking about this with the kids this past week in Acts chapter 2. It says that there is a path that leads to life and that God will give us joy along that path, but it requires us to step out in faith and trust him because his ways are far above our ways. And so when he says things like to love our enemies, we go, What? doesn't make any sense. But he says that that's the path that leads to life. When he says forgive somebody 70 times 7, you're like, but they keep hurting me. They keep hurting me. I I don't want to do that. And he goes, no, this is the path that leads to life. And not just life for yourself. We see when Noah starts walking this path, it leads to life for others around him too. Starts being a blessing to the world but it's hard. It is hard. I'm not going to beat around it on that. It is hard. I got one more scripture for us. Old Testament. It's a prophet. His name's Habakkuk. Let's bring that name back. If you got to have any kids on the way, any little sons, name them Habakkuk. We'll bring that name back. No, don't do that. (laughs) Chapter 2, verse 4 says, see, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright. It says, but the righteous person, not the self-righteous person, but the person who God says is righteous. It says, but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. I want to be a righteous person. I want to be right with God and right with others. I want to walk in faith and be called faithful. I want to be somebody who can be trusted because I'm whole and complete walking in God's path, right? When we start looking only after our own interests, we're, we're one way one day and then the next day we're different because we f- it's all about what we feel one day and then what I feel like the next day. No, I want to be whole and complete in the Lord. I want to I wanna walk these ancient paths that lead to life. Now obedience doesn't sound so bad, right? Because you go, oh, no, it's, it's about allegiance to one who is good and has something good for me. And so I put my trust in him, and I take little steps of faith. He told Noah to build a boat. And my challenge to you guys today is to build a boat. I don't know what your boat looks like. And before you get to that big of a boat, you're going to have to start with some little boats, right? You're going to have to start with little steps of faith. But I'm going to help you out. I'm going to give you your first piece of lumber for that little step. Sometimes I need reminders. Sometimes I need reminders. So what is your step today? Maybe God is calling you to share your faith with somebody in your workplace, that your, that your act of trust would be a blessing, bringing a, the Savior of the world to the place where you work or to your friend circle. Maybe an act of faith is for you to finally forgive that person that has hurt you. Maybe the act of faith is to let go of something you've been holding on to or someone you've been holding on to so tight for so many years that it's getting in the way of your relationship with God. What is your step of faith? I'm going to pray for us right now because we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it to us. Just like God spoke to Noah, he impresses things on our minds and in our hearts. 
relationships that need to be patched up, but it's going to cost me, it's going to cost me something. I might have to swallow my pride, right? Things that I, maybe where I wronged somebody and I need to go make it right. It's going to take a step of faith. That in the long run, right, as we put our sights on things that are not yet seen, we can trust in Jesus that this is the right step for me today as I build my boat. Build a boat. Heavenly Father, right here in this moment, right now, reveal to us, each one of us in our hearts, what our step of faith is today. Maybe you're asking us to go start a business, but it's scary. It's risky. It's difficult to do. Maybe there's a ministry that you're putting on our hearts that we've been ignoring for a while that we ask that you bring to our minds right here, right now, because we can make a difference in the world. We can right injustices. We can, we can help those who have been forgotten or beaten down. Maybe you're asking us to forgive somebody here today. Maybe you're asking us to just commit to sacrificially serving somebody in love who we've been neglecting for far too long. Maybe you're asking us to embrace the people that you've put in our lives, that you've, you've called us maybe because they're younger than us or, or, or they have some needs that we can provide for. Maybe you're asking us to step into their life and intentionally commit to that person today to say, hey, I'm going to walk with you even though it's going to be hard, even though you might break my heart, I will walk with you. Maybe today is the day for someone in this room where you choose to finally say, God, I'm going to trust you with my life, with my fears, with my hurts, with my future. And I'm going to ask for your forgiveness for all that I have done in my life trying to do it my way. Because I trust you. I know that you love me. That you have died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sins so that you can forgive me. That justice has already been served. That it's been taken care of. And so I can walk in the freedom of being your child. Maybe that's the decision you need to make today. As you step out in faith, as you, as you begin to build a boat that is a, one step after the next step after the next step of walking in faith, following our God, Lord, reveal to us where our step is. We're listening right now. We're listening. Father, we desire to be a people of faith. Find us faithful. Help us trust. It's scary, I know. You keep asking me to take another step to trust you more and more, and it's scary every time. But give us that kind of courage because of our love for you, because we're responding to your love for us, because we feel and have tasted that new life, and because we want to keep experiencing you. We love you, Jesus. We pray these things in your beautiful, precious name. Amen. All right, we're wrapping up here, but on these tables up front here, I have a whole bunch more of these little pieces of wood, little Jenga blocks. And for me, it's really good for me to have a reminder. I've had these moments in my life, way markers, that, that change who I am because of how I've experienced God. And so if he's putting something on your heart today, come up, grab a Sharpie, grab one of these blocks, and write down what your boat is. Or maybe you haven't heard from him and you're not ready to write down that boat yet, but you need to write down, build a boat to remind you. And you can take this and put it on your desk or your nightstand or keep it in your pocket as you, 
as you expectantly live looking towards the future, not today, but towards eternity with God. And so we trust him with our future, with our day-to-day, with our decisions, and we all work on building a boat.